Welcome to this lecture on pharmacokinetics. In this lecture, we'll first understand what this concept means, and then we'll go into the four phases of pharmacokinetics, being the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and then finally, elimination. So let's start off with a definition and understand the concept of what it really is. So here's the word, pharmacokinetics. Let's break it down. Pharmaco, pharmacy, drugs. So we're referring to the drug, Kinetics is movement. So essentially what pharmacokinetics is, is the way that the drug moves through the body, or more precisely, the way drugs enter the body, moves through the body, and then leaves the body. So that's essentially pharmacokinetics. Now, how does it do it? What are the four processes? Well, we've got absorption, which refers to the way the drug goes from administration and moves into the blood. Then we have distribution, which is essentially how does, the, how does the drug, once in the blood, move in and out and around tissue, and how wide does it distribute? Then we move to metabolism. So this is essentially how does it chemically alter the drug, predominantly the liver. So how does the drug either become activated, or how does the drug become inactivated or less activated? And then finally, elimination, which we all could, also could be called um, excretion, and this is the way that the drug moves out of the body. All right, so let's start with absorption. So absorption, as we said, is the way that the drug is getting into the blood. Now, there's many different routes or there's many different ways that we could administer drugs. So I'm going to get to that in a second, but the first principle that I want you to get across is the way that drugs can transport the different transportation methods to get into the blood. So this takes us back to cellular biology and the different types of transport. So we can have passive transport, that's one. We can have facilitated transport, that's two. We can have active transport, that's three. And then lastly, bulk transport or endocytosis. So these are the four ways that drugs can be absorbed and move into the blood. So let's show an example of this. Imagine that this is just a capillary bed and imagine that this is just one cell layer thick. We know that the cells have a membrane and we call this a phospholipid membrane because they have phospholipids. And there's two layers, okay? So we call it a bilayer because it's got two. Now remember the phosphate heads, which are these are circles, they are water loving whilst the tails are lipid-like, so they don't like water, so they are a lipid, sorry, water hating or hydrophobic. Okay, so we've got a phospholipid bilayer, two layers, which means that certain things will move differently across this membrane. So transport one is passive transport. Certain drugs can passively move through the membrane. And this is from a high to a low gradient. It's going to be higher where we actually give the drug and lower where we want the drug to go into the blood. So a good example of passive transport would be a fat soluble drug. So fat soluble drugs can actually move straight through the membrane because the, most of the membrane is fat itself so it can move straight into it. Very simple. If the drug is water soluble but very small, there could be aquaporins in the membrane which are just water channels and these drugs can still passively move through. And so this is still passive transport, moving from a concentration of high to low. Again, it's passively absorbed, okay? It doesn't need energy, but it's a bit harder because it needs a bit of help, but still passive. The next one is that it's water soluble, but it's a bit bigger, which means it needs a bit of assistance. And this is where you have a channel, okay? And essentially what will need to happen is this bigger water-soluble drug will need to get carried across. But it's still going to be following its gradient, so it's still not using energy. Now, when the transport is um, requiring energy, so we need to actually pull things across, we're now going to require ATP. And this is usually by a bigger molecule, a bigger water-soluble drug. And this will require a transporter but with ATP, okay, to, to pull it across, okay? And then lastly, we have endocytosis, which essentially is a really big drug molecule, and the membrane has to kind of engulf it, bring it in, and then pop it through, okay? And that's the biggest type of transport. So these types of transport will affect the absorption 
of the drug. Now let's look at the first most common route that we give medication or administer medication. This is through the GIT, the gastrointestinal tract. The reason why we give drugs you know, like capsules, tablets, syrups through GIT is because it's convenient. It's much easier to do that than put it into your muscle or into your vein. Very convenient. Now, depending on the drug, would it depend on the way it's transported, would depend on how well it's put into the blood. So let's just say drug X is 100 milligrams. Okay, how much gets into the blood? Well, we've already spoke about depends on the type of drug chemical, depending on how well it can get across the membrane. Okay, but with the gastrointestinal tract, some things that works well for it is it's got a big surface area. So you've got eight meters of your intestines. That's pretty long. If you were to flatten it all out, you remember you've got villi and microvilli, which increases the surface area. If you were to flatten all that out, it would almost become the size of a tennis court. So that's a lot of surface area. It's also got a very rich blood supply, which means the absorption will increase. But remember, Everything that goes into the gastrointestinal tract, basically from your esophagus to your rectum, that kind of seven meters, has to go through the gatekeeper first. What's the gatekeeper? The gatekeeper is the liver. So all that blood with the drug in it has to first go through the liver to possibly be metabolized. And we call this first pass because it has to pass first through the liver, through the portal venous system. The liver will decide if it likes the drug or not and then it will put it into the blood. Now, depending on a few things will depend on how much drug makes it through. So if we were to give a drug as a dose, 100 milligrams, and we only found that 50 milligrams made it in, this would be 100 divided by 50, which gives you 0.5. That means 0.5 or 50% of the drug made it. This is an important concept, we call this bioavailability. So this drug has a bioavailability of 50%. What would be 100%? Well, if you compare it to IV, so again, you give drug X, 100 milligrams of drug X. Now, you put it straight into the blood. So you inject it into your vein, straight in, or to patient's vein. That means 100% gets in. The dose was 100. Now in the blood plasma is 100. 100 divided by 100 is 1. That means it's 100% bioavailability. That's an important concept. So with absorption, bioavailability means from the dose, how much makes it into the plasma. That's a bioavailability. So what things could impact the GIT? Well, we saw the liver can knock it out. A good example of what knocks out the, a drug that the liver knocks out is GTN. So the GTN doesn't really pass through the liver very well, so it has a very poor first pass metabolism. So we don't usually give GTN orally, at least swallowing. We'll get back to it in a second how we may give it. What else may go wrong? Well, not so much go wrong, but have limitations. Well, there's different pHs in different tissue. So the, the, the environment, the pH environment, in the way that you give drugs, impacts the way it's absorbed depending on the chemical structure of the drug. So we know that the stomach is acidic, that might impact the drug's absorption. We know that the intestines alkaline or basic, that might impact the way the drug is absorbed. Surface area we spoke about, also the blood supply, the degree of amount of blood that flows to an area will impact its ability to be absorbed. Okay, And the time it takes or the time it's exposed to that region will also impact it. So with a GIT, if your patient was to have diarrhea, so it's passing through quickly, that's gonna decrease absorption, okay? Or if your patient had constipation or they had food with it, that would also impact absorption. Remember you have enzymes in your gastrointestinal tract. So enzymes can interfere with the medications. Example is insulin. In insulin is a protein. And so enzymes in your GIT might degrade the insulin, therefore insulin doesn't get put into the blood. So again, this is why we don't give insulin through a GIT route. Now, but before we move on, you may ask about GTN. We do give GTN orally, we don't swallow it, we do give it um, under the tongue. 
So sublingually. Okay, so sublingually is under the tongue. How does that get absorbed? Well, it has a very good absorption capacity, so it can go across the membrane very well. In your mucous membrane, in your buckle, under the tongue, in your mouth, it can get absorbed. It has a rich blood supply, so it can get absorbed straight into the blood. So it has a much better bioavailability sublingually as we do through an oral or through the gastrointestinal means. Moving on, what about skin? When would we give drugs on the skin? So this is usually topically. Remember, the skin is waterproof, so we probably, drugs that are water soluble probably don't work so well. So drugs that are fat soluble that can move through the membrane work a lot better. Some examples of drugs you may wanna give on the skin would be drugs that you wanna work at the skin level. So if we have inflamed skin, like dermatitis, you might wanna put a steroid, okay, on this skin like cortisone, which then it gets absorbed just in that region and then works in that region. But we can also give some drugs that again get absorbed well into the blood. So this could be like nicotine, okay? We could give fentanyl, or we could also give GTN on the skin. Moving on, what about under the skin? This could be through a route subcutaneous. Now, subcutaneous has, has a lot of fat. Now, fat doesn't have a good blood supply. So remember we said to have good absorption, we need to have a good, supp good supply of blood. Fat doesn't, only about 5% of blood, total blood flow goes to the fat. So it doesn't, drugs aren't well absorbed in that region. But this could be an advantage. Sometimes we wanna give a drug that's slowly absorbed over time. So it has a slow absorption slowly seeps into the blood. Examples could be insulin again, or certain contraceptive medications. What about intramuscular? So you may wanna give drugs straight into the muscle. Muscles are 75% water. So water soluble drugs will work well here. Muscles have a pretty good blood supply. So probably about 10%, 10 to 15% maybe not quite 15%, but at least about 10% of total blood flow goes to muscles. So it gets a pretty good blood supply. That means we get a good absorption. So some drugs through intermuscular injection will work well. Finally, IV we spoke about, if you're giving the drug straight into the vein, you're getting a complete bioavailability. So now you have the drug in your blood, which means we now can move to distribution. Moving now to distribution. Distribution basically means how well does the drug move from the blood into tissue and how wide to the different compartments of the tissue. So does it just localize in the blood or does it move slightly out into the extracellular or does it go into the intracellular or does it go into even all the fat and all the other regions of the body? So the greater it moves, the greater distribution it has which we call the apparent volume of distribution. And this is, the way you work this out is the dose divided by the concentration in the plasma. So imagine that you gave the dose of 100 milligrams and if you took one hour later, you took a reading of the blood and you found that the reading was 80 milligrams that would tell you that most of the drug, 80% is still in the blood. So it has a very poor distribution. So basically, as this number goes down, the plasma concentration goes down, the distribution goes up, which essentially means more drug is moving out of the blood, therefore the plasma reading is going down and it's moving to other spaces. Some of the things that would increase the speed and the distribution would be the blood flow. So certain tissue that has greater blood flow, such as your brain, your lungs, your heart, your liver, your kidneys have a very good blood flow. So that the speed of distribution is gonna be increased for those areas, but also the properties of the drug itself. So if it's a fat soluble drug, therefore it can move through membranes easier. Fat soluble drugs can move well off through all the tissue in the body Therefore, the, vo the volume of distribution is gonna be up. Therefore, the amount in the blood is gonna be down. 
Another factor that's important is in the blood, we have proteins. An example of a plasma protein is albumin. Albumin is usually a good carrier for some drugs. And if the, if the protein holds on to the drug, that means the drug isn't free to move, not only to move to tissue, but also to move to cause the action that you want the drug to do. If it's held in the blood, that means the volume of distribution goes down, but the plasma concentration goes up because it's staying in the blood, which could be a bad thing if you want that drug to work, let's say, in the neurons. But if you want the drug to work in the plasma, an example would be warfarin. Warfarin has a very poor volume of distribution because a lot of it will stay in the plasma. That's because it's locked on to some plasma proteins. But that's okay because you want warfarin to actually work in the blood as a blood thinner, okay, or to stop coagulation. So in that case, it works well. But if you want a drug to work off in certain tissue like the brain, it needs to be probably fat soluble because it needs to move through membranes. And in the brain, we know that we have a blood brain barrier, so it needs to be able to move through many membranes pretty quickly. So then, therefore, the volume of distribution for that particular drug needs to be enhanced. So that's distribution. What about metabolism? Well, metabolism refers to the, the way that the drug is chemically altered. Now, the, this could be making the drug actually turned on, activated. So you could have an inactivated drug but the liver then activates it. Maybe an example of this could be codeine being made into morphine, like a prodrug into an active drug, or the liver can actually alter it and turn it off or make it least effective. So there's other tissue that can do metabolism, like the intestines, the lung, okay, the kidney, but the liver is the primary organ. Now, the way that the liver does this is there's two phases. So we have phase one and phase two. Phase one, what it's trying to do with phase one is make the drug less lipid soluble and more water soluble. Okay, so phase one, okay, metabolism, and it uses an enzyme here called cytochrome. P450. And what these enzymes do is probably three main things is oxidizers, hydrolysis, and reduction. And what this does is essentially makes it less lipid soluble and more water soluble. So then when it goes to elimination, which is at the kidney level, it's easier to get rid of. The second phase is conjugation. And what happens in conjugation is it adds a group to the drug. So this could be a methyl group, a sulfur group, a glucuride or amino acid, there's others. But essentially it puts a bigger group onto the drug which makes it more polar and again it's much easier to eliminate. So they're the two main phases of metabolism. Now in some cases these enzymes can be sped up Okay, so for instance, some drugs or some foods like grapefruit juice speeds up the enzymes. That means you can metabolize drugs quicker or some drugs can slow down these enzymes and make the metabolism slower. That means the drugs will start building up in the blood like antibiotics can in interfere with it. Other things that can interfere with the liver could be the age. So infants have a slower metabolism because their liver is immature, or the elderly, their liver's kind of starting to wear out, so their metabolism is slower. Or if a person was to have some problems with a liver, like liver failure, that would also impact their ability to met metabolize and either inactivate or activate the drugs. Finally, we move on to elimination. Now, firstly, it's just important to note that limit elimination actually works with metabolism. To eliminate the drug could be either to just get rid of it while it's still active, that's excretion, or elimination could be to turn it off, which is part of metabolism. So sometimes elimination might be caught up with, with excretion itself. How do we get rid of the drug? Well, the primary organ is the kidney. Now, as we spoke about 
the, the kidney filters the blood and puts it into the urine, which is essentially water. So we really need to make the drug water soluble. Now there's three main ways that the kidney can get rid of um, medication. Firstly is through glomerular filtration. Okay, so we know how the kidneys work. We essentially push through high pressure blood plasma into the glomerulus and this turns into filtrate. So any small enough molecule of drug, whether it's fat soluble or water soluble, can get into the filtrate. Once it's in the filtrate, if it is, water, if it is lipid soluble, it can actually get reabsorbed across the nephron back into the blood. So now it goes into the, black, the blood, so that's not so good. We there have to put through it through phase one, maybe phase two metabolism to get rid of it. But if it's already made water soluble, once it's in the filtrate, it will get excreted out. So once it is water soluble through the filtrate, it can be excreted. Number two is through tubular secretion. So this is basically once you're moving through the nephron, as we move through the PCT into the into the loop of Henlay, into the DCT, etc. We have blood vessels that wrap around it. And once the, 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 the drug has been conjugated and it's got a big polar group to it, it can actually be secreted back. So we can go from the blood, push it across. So if this was, this is the blood, this is the nephron. So here we have a cell, here's the nephron. This is where the urine will essentially be. If this is the blood vessel following the nephron, if we've, got a, if we've got a drug here with a polar group on it, what can happen is we can get this drug through a facilitated transporter and push it through, and then we can put it into the urine. This is tubular secretion. Once it's in the urine, it can't get back because it's too big and doesn't have a carrier. That means we can now urinate it out. Finally, we have reabsorption. Essentially what happens here is any molecule that is in the urine has the potential to be, if it's small enough or lipid soluble, to be put back into the blood through, through the nephron. But if the urine has a different pH to the actual drug, so for instance, if the drug is a weak acid and the urine is a weak base, it can alter it enough to allow it to change in the urine and then to be excreted out and vice versa. If the drug is a, a weak base and the urine is a weak acid, then you can excrete it that way as well. So that's the method through the kidney. Finally, another way you can get rid of drugs where you can get it through your skin, you can breathe out drugs, you can sweat out drugs, you can get drugs through tears or through breast milk. We spoke about the kidney, but the other way you can do it is through the liver into bile. So some drugs can be excreted into the bile, which biles produce about uh, half a litre to a litre a day. That bile then gets put into the digestive tract and then that can get excreted as faeces. One important note is some of that can be reabsorbed back into the blood through the GRT, especially if the bacteria has altered the drug and then it can be reabsorbed. And this could kind of go on for a bit of time, which would affect the way that the drug is excreted and the half-life of the drug. So there we have it. Hopefully now you've understood what pharmacokinetics is as a concept and you can tell what the four phases and what's actually happening in the four phases to alter the way that the drug moves into the body, through the body and then out of the body.